Good morning. My name is Victoria and I am the sole and only operator of Victoria's Wool. I design knitting patterns very, very slowly. For the hand knitters in the world, And on this podcast, I generally talk about the projects I'm working on, um, yarn I've purchased, um, and things I'm thinking about that hopefully pertain to knitting. Not always, but hopefully. Sometimes my mom is on the show, um, but she doesn't always, I mean, she would probably be fine with being on it all the time. But um, sometimes I have maybe a longer, longer mo- monologue that I want to share, then she doesn't need to sit and listen to it because she's already heard it. Everything that I say here has definitely been already said to my mom. It's Sunday, March 22nd, so we're about a week and a half into our quarantine from COVID-19, and um, I don't want to talk about it too much because a lot of pe- it's really been really hard for a lot of people and really sad. There's a lot of people struggling, and um, I want to create something enjoyable and happy to distract people and help help them um, keep them entertained while they knit. So I don't want to talk about too much, but um, I do want to say that I am <clears throat> at home all the time because one of my jobs is to work from home for another small farming business on the island that I live on. I do work for them for my house, so I'm still doing that. And uh, obviously, any victorious wool business that I do is virtual and from home as well. So those two things are the same. Um, I was doing farmer's markets every Sunday in West Seattle. But the city of Seattle closed all street events for at least four weeks, I think. So um, we won't be back out until mid-April. So uh, I'm not doing that right now. So. I'm not working as much as I was and I'm not going anywhere else. No one's coming over to visit. Um, I've, I've gone out almost every day for a walk. I've been walking about four, there's a 4.6 mile walk from my house to the beach. And so I've been trying to do that most days. And if not that, then I go walk to this. There's a certain house down the road that I walk to and, and turn around and come back. Um, but otherwise, I haven't been going anywhere doing anything but being home. And uh, knitting has definitely been, and having so much yarn and having so many projects has been the perfect prep for such a life as this. Oh, I'm drinking out of my tote. You're in a wool cup. I'm drinking the um, mango ginger tea from Yogi. It's one of my favorites. Um, yeah. Well, the first um, project that I picked up, I think at the beginning of the week of the 8th, I think. So not this last week, but the second week of March, I had the idea that I could um, knit and take kind of sort of faked time-lapse photos of the Pebbles and Pathways socks that I had started in January by Hay Brownberry. It's Marceline Smith, I think is her, her name. Um, let me put it on my sock blocker here. Someday I'll get really nice wooden sock blockers, but every time I want to go, every time I want to buy them, I go look at the price and go, oh, yeah, they're so expensive. And actually, this sock blocker is kind of too long in the foot for this sock. Anyway, <laughs> got long. Oops, I've already got a. They've already got a blemish on them from from where. So these are for my mom on both sides. She must have stepped in something. Anyway, um, this is the Pebbles and Pathways sock. I uh, had knit one in January, um, decided to give them to my mom. So I measured them to her foot. Um, she's about a nine and a half, ten, size ten, nine and a half, ten. Same size foot as me, but she has a different width of calf, so she did have to try them. I did increase, starting here, I increased two stitches every other round, 
to make the cat. And you know what? She's been wearing them every day. So she said nothing about the fit complaint wise. So I think she really likes them. In fact, the other pair of socks I knit her years ago, she wears those too. It's important to pay attention to who wears the things you make because those are the people you're going to, those are the people that I'm going to continue to knit for, are the people that are wearing it without, like, it or just wearing them. You know, they like them a lot and it has nothing to do with uh, trying to make me feel good about something I made them. So they have a little cable that runs up the front. Sorry, runs up the side of the instep. They were done toe up. Um, it was the first time I'd ever done a toe up sock, I think, that wasn't. I knit a handful of pairs of socks back in like the early. 2010s, what are those, the tweens, I think, maybe, anyway, I knit a bunch, short row heel, I think I one did one sock of gusset flap, um, I think I talked about my last solo podcast that I was excited to find that the heel flap and gusset is actually a really easy thing to do, and um, not hard like it was years ago when I was attempting to do socks for the first time. It's really easy for me now. I'm much better at following directions now than I was back then. So um, anyway, I did a time lapse. So I started with the toe. I picked the toe up. I had started the toe kind of like halfway through the toe in January. And then I um, stopped. I was using the juicy juice. Judy's surprisingly... Judy's cast magic cast on Judy's magic cast on to cast on the toe. And then I had stopped and lost to my sock mojo. And then as I said, at the beginning of March, I felt like what if I took a picture of it in multiple stages and I haven't edited it together. I did take photos of it every day in the same, generally in the same place. One time I took it in the car on a white background. It sort of looks different, but I edited it enough to look similar. But every stage from the beginning of the toe all the way up to the, the ribbing, I have pictures of. So I'm going to edit them together with a little music and maybe I'll put it in here. And um, I'm definitely going to post it to Instagram because it was just really fun to get motivated to get to the next photo and so I finished these socks in or this one sock in like four or five days or something really fast for me anyway a sock that fast that's a sock fast fast sock for me so yeah that was a very successful project and a and a whip off the list and I'm really pleased that my mom liked them so much uh, my mom is not going into chemo in the last podcast we talked about she was going to start chemo and that's not going to happen because of COVID-19 um, for a little while. So if anybody was worried about her and wondering how she was doing with the, um, virus going around, she's fine. We're all just going to stay healthy and not, um, hopefully not get sick. And then she should be just fine when she starts. Hopefully we'll see what happens in the world. Um, then ne the next thing I picked up, um, was, the tensel. So the tensel sweater is by Emily Green. It was a Brooklyn Tweed publication. Um, it came out in 2018 in the summer because it's a really um, eyelid-y, lacy design. I don't know if I have pictures of it. Pictures of the pattern. I do print it out from a long time ago. And uh, I had got excited when I had seen it come out and bought the pattern and had some yarn for it already and purchased additional skeins, which I forgot about, so I didn't alternate. Um, let's see if I can get that to be in focus. Can you see it? So it's a three quarter, very lightweight, lacy, um, kind of summery sweater. And um, I did use Brooklyn Tweed Loft, I am using it. And what I had before last, the sun, before I had 
the last Saturday. Sorry, what I'm trying to say is the place that I was at in the project before the 14th of March was about a third, a quarter to a third of the back and the front. I started out knitting the two together because I was concerned that I have fairly very engaged, especially with a wool and spun yarn that changes so much. There's so much air in it, depending on how you knit with it, it, it can expand after blocking a lot. Um, so I was concerned about making them the same size and when, and it's a seamed sweater. That was, that's the big, that's the big thing I should have noted. It's a seamed sweater. I've never done that before. I've never knit pieces and seen them together before. I don't really, I don't sew at all. I was going to say I don't really sew, but I don't sew. Um, <clears throat> so I was trying to get them to be the same size. And uh, I picked it up. I knit about an inch and a half on both the first day and then thought, you know what? I bet I could finish this in the quarantine time that we have. You know, I'm not, I'm not working as much. I'm home all the time. Like I need something to like, I need like a mission, like a, a project to really drive myself from day to day so that I don't feel um, claustrophobic or bored or unhappy because I really don't want to be unhappy. And for me personally, there's not a lot going on that is really emergency. Um, there's a toilet paper issue, but, but <laughs> just kidding, we're fine. Um, but sad, I just don't want to feel miserable. I wanted to enjoy um, the slower time as much as I can. So I wanted to have something that I was going to look forward to doing every day. And when I woke up in the morning, it was going to be like, oh, I get to work on the project. So I did head on into this project really intensely and finished both the front and the back sections um, in six days. So I have those to show you. I'm gonna show you the front first. I finished the back um, after three days of working on it, but I'm gonna show you the front first because it's the most available to me to pick up at this time. It's a little curly. I haven't blocked it yet because I'm gonna block everything together. So this will be the front and there'll be that big turtleneck that I'll get picked up. And then the back, I pinned out because it was extra curly and I wanted to see, I have just left it on here. I haven't blocked it, I just pinned it here. So here's the bottom. There's this, there's a, the lace going straight in the center and the sides of the body. And then there's the diagonal panels that go on either side of that. Yeah. Um, I guess the next thing to say about this project, this is a really big project for me. Um, it's my last old whip. Everything else besides this is either from 2020 or something I started in the very last months of 2019. And that has never, ever been the case, probably since I very much started knitting, that I would only have projects that were recent that weren't just super old sitting around. I used to cast on stuff all the time. I used to work in an in a independent pharmacy that sold, sold Malabrigo when Malabrigo was just becoming really popular and um, Cascade. And so it was a store that was lovely and wonderful people owning it and wonderful people to work with, but it was a retail job and it was a little boring a lot of the time. And I worked there for like 12 years. I worked there from like 16 to 27 or something on and off different quantities of time. But it was a space I was very familiar with, a job I was well-versed with. So we were bored a lot of the time and trying to keep ourselves busy. And one of the things I would do would wander over and pull colors off the yarn wall and play with color combinations in, in spare moments. And then I would like buy something on my lunch break, buy needles, buy yarn, and like cast on something. And so I cast on a lot of stuff. Like people talk about cast on items. I just would cast on because I'd be bored sitting in front of yarn. I'm sure... Most knitters would have done this too. Um, you just can't help. And I wasn't, I wasn't good enough. I mean, I had projects, but I, it wasn't also like that I could, I couldn't knit while working. That wasn't allowed. But I could, I could dream and look through books. We had knitting books too and stuff. Anyway, I started a lot of stuff. So I very, very much had way too many cast-ons like probably 
I don't know, something between 30 and 50. At some point, little bits of stuff here and there cast on. And so that's probably why I haven't really thought about that until this moment. It's probably why I'm so obsessed with not having a lot of projects because that's kind of how I started out with just this overwhelming abundance and feeling like I wasn't very good at knitting and I couldn't finish things. And so I really like paring down the list, checking things off and not having a lot to work on. It's really exciting Um, because it means the things that you're planning and the things that you're seeing are so much more likely to be what you're currently working. That's like faster coming into your actual, into an actual project than just this dream far off in the distance. And I've talked about projects in the whips a lot on this podcast already. Um, but this is the last one. It's, there's a list over here on the side of the wall next to my desk that has stashed whips. It says it from, has the column of 2017 and a column of 2018. And everything has either been taken off, like, like, marked out because they decided not to, to finish it or it's been checked or X'd in this case if I actually finished it. Like there's things on there like the over the top tee that I finished, the newsprint cowl. Um, I finished a pair of socks from By Very Pink, a basic pattern by Very Pink Knits. Uh, my Threshold by Melanie Berg was on this list. Barndom, which I finished in, de- in um, December, which I showed on the last, last episodes that's finished because that was on this list too. Um, I finished a pair of my own zebra mittens for Knit City in 2019, 18, 18, that I finished, um, Wool and Honey's on there by Caitlin Hunter. And I have written on there the sock pattern that I think that was must have been Snowy Dreams I finished. And then there's Tencel. So it's really exciting to be actually working on the last thing on this epic list that I've had up here at least since I think I started that list in the beginning of 2018 when I did a big purge. I talked about that before. I made this list of I had like 13 things, 13 total projects, I think, that I kept, which was pretty, actually pretty small list, depending on whose perspective you're looking from. But my perspective, 13 was pretty small. And so now I'm looking more at a list of like, well, obviously a list of one. There's one item on that list now, um, you know, two years later. But, of course, I have other whips, but they're all from, I think, November or later, and most of them are from the last, like, few weeks. So, it's a really big deal for me, and I wanted to take this time of being stuck at home and make it um, a really big, as big of a celebration as I could. So, that's why this project matters so much. Um, And I took it really intensely, seriously, because how am I going to make this pattern? This is what I thought, like a week ago. How am I going to make this pattern easier for me to follow? Um, you know, I was making a lot of mistakes. You make a lot of mistakes in a project and you have to fix them all the time. It's kind of discouraging. So what I did, and I can't show you because it reveals too much of the pattern and I, I don't want to disrespect um, Emily Green's copyright and Brooklyn Tweet's copyright. So basically what I did and what I realized again for like the millionth time is that I have a learning disability And I do best following complicated patterns if I memorize things. And one of the ways that I can memorize something is by changing the format. So I knew that if I redid the charts and if I redid the lines of direction and condensed things in a way, got got rid of the extra words I no longer needed to know. Like, um, I, I would... This is generally this is this is like the second or third time I've done a Brooklyn Tweed pattern. There's a lot of pages, and they do a beautiful layout, and they they put a little bit of information on one page, and so there is a lot of pages, and you got to find all the things you need to look at. So you have like your chart page with your with the key, and then you have your row direction, and for these two rows I was following for like many many inches, like 15 inches, it was like a paragraph of text like this big two rows and a chart that was just this big. And I realized the chart was placed, you do follow chart A and you follow chart B, and it was written, put on the page reading left to right, because that's how we read. We read left to right, right? I always get this confused. Yes, we read left to right. Yeah, to visualize in my mind. Words on a page and then follow and see where my eyes went. 
we read left to right, so the charts were listed left to right. But as you come to them in the knitting in front of you, you come to them right to left. And so I was having a hard time translating, making sure I was following the right pattern, let alone the right row number. So I have a charting software, I use charting software, I use Stitch Mastery for my own designing. I love Stitch Mastery, I'm kind of obsessed with that software program because it makes really nice charts. And one of the satisfying things about writing a pattern is making a really nice chart, making a really nice pattern format and everything. It looks really pretty. And so I have spent some time dinking around that, on that program. There's a lot of YouTube videos fr from the people that made that program to help people figure out how to do things faster and stuff because it's, pretty in, it's, an, it's an intense program. Not as intense as InDesign, but it's an intense program. So there's a lot of stuff that you can do to make the whole, the whole charting process streamlined and fast. And so I love it spend a lot of time with it and anytime actually that I can make it take a chart from someone else's pattern and redo it in a way that I think would be better for me um, for me to follow then I will so I redid the chart made it bigger re, you know put the charts in the order that I actually come across in my knitting um, and then I put them on the same page as that one paragraph row direction and I changed the row direction dramatically got rid of all the extra words, put it in a vertical manner so I could literally go down and see. I changed, highlighted, and colored the texts that were all the same. You know, there were a front and back, front and end section of each row that was exactly the same. So I highlighted th that in a specific color and that thing. Um, I also changed the chart to have the symbols that I see more commonly than the ones that were listed um, by Brooklyn Tweet. I didn't want to have to look at a symbol and go, okay, that little W with the squiggly that kind of looks like an ampersand, but the squiggly is going off to the left. That means make one left. That means make one right. Da, da, da. And I was like, I don't want, I want the symbols that I would use when I chart because I want to be able to know this pattern so quickly that there's no need, you know, when you're watching something or listening to something while you knit, it needs to be second nature. So my goal was, how can I make this pattern second nature to me? And I realized that yeah, it's because I probably, you know, de most definitely have a learning disability. I don't track very well with my eyes. I never did. I had glasses for a little bit when I was a kid. Um, I should probably get glasses soon again as I'm getting older. It's definitely becoming a little bit apparent. I'm not sure I'm ready for it emotionally. But I don't have bad vision in the sense that I need glasses because I can't track words. Um, it's probably some form of dyslexia. I don't know what it is. It doesn't really need to be labeled. I don't need to go get treatment. I don't think I understand it pretty well on how to get, how to make things work for me. And one of the ways is, is organizing information in particular sequences so that I can memorize it. And then I don't make as many mistakes. And that is absolutely the truth with what happened. When I finished the back panel with my new one page, all the information I needed on it, um, I was still making mistakes, but I had gotten better. And then when I started the, the um, well, one caveat I didn't say is after the first day of working on this, I split the back front and back up because I realized I needed to make progress. So I felt like I was getting somewhere rather than working on the back and the front at the same time, the whole time I needed to split them up. And I said, the gauge is going to be similar enough because I'm going to finish both front and back panels within days of each other. So it's not as if I'm going to finish one wait months and then finish another and the gauge can be very very different i think when i'm knitting something generally in the same time frame my my attention is pretty consistent it's if i have huge blocks of time in between working on something and i don't remember i have to re-familiarize myself with the yarn that i can see huge changes so anyway finish the back piece and then when i started picking up the front no mistakes i stopped making errors i stopped adding yarn overs where i shouldn't um I hit this the right amount of stitches every at the beginning and end of every row spot on. So I'm really happy that the front panel, which is the one I'm actually going to see on a regular basis, is pretty pristine. So that whole process of going through and changing the format to what I needed um, really worked for me and has worked for me in the past. And I highly recommend anybody do that if they're struggling to follow the information um, and they want to change it. You know, I think a lot of people do it anyway. They write notes or they, um, I've had people like who've 
done done my patterns, like email me like a, a gra a chart that they made with all the stuff, and I'm like, if that's helpful for you, then great. Like I can't do that when I write patterns all the time because it just takes a lot of space and time um, and effort to make it look professional when you do that. But I absolutely 100% think that people should write down notes if it's helpful for them. I also, um, one of the things I started doing years ago, I probably talked about it already, is I write in a little black book. I rewrite a patterns rose. I summarize um, so that I can actually check off I actually write out if I'm going to repeat, you know, row, knit one, knit row one and two, and then repeat the last two rows for seven times. I actually write one, two, seven times so I can check off each one. And I look for triggers, things in the knitting to help me remember what side or where I am so that I have actually a redundancy of knowing where, of how I can figure out what row I'm on. But I wrote, I write it down. And I also can read my knitting. And those two things um, have become second nature in taking notes. So that when I stop working on a project, I can go back to it months later and I know exactly what row I am, the, exactly what row I'm on. And that was something I couldn't do for a long time. And so I'm really proud of the way that I have figured out how my brain works and what I need to do. And I think that uh, it would I hope everybody does that. Um, everybody can make patterns and knitting as as smooth of a process as possible and fun and enjoyable. And it, and what I did definitely made this pattern work for me it was, I don't know how else I could have struggled through, you know, looking at the graph and looking at the words and struggling through oh, for a really long time. I mean, <clears throat> I probably spent probably 24 to 30 hours knitting the front and the back panels, which seems fast to me because this is a fingering weight, although it's lace on a size three, it's pretty small. Um, progress keepers help a lot where you move that little, I've been using a coffee bean, a little ceramic coffee bean, you move that up, measuring how much progress you're making. Um, yeah. The other thing to note about this pattern <clears throat> that I don't recommend anybody else do is if you are going to, if you want to learn, to me, this is what I would say to myself two years ago when I picked this pattern. If you want to work, do a seamed sweater, you need to get gauge, which I didn't, and I was fine with at the time. And also practice on an air and weight garment. I, I, after I'm done with this, I, I'm going to look for a basic pullover, um, in a worsted weight, maybe DK, worsted weight or Aran weight yarn that is a seam, a seam sweater in a bigger weight so that I can practice making pieces that fit together nicely and putting the sleeve cap in um, on something bigger, excuse me, because it's less, and something stockinette, you know, that makes so much more sense to me now than picking out a very particular lace pattern um, that means, like, I really want this sweater. It means a lot to me. There's just a lot of, yeah, that's it, not the best move, I think. It seems to me, having not finished yet, because I haven't done the sleeves or seamed yet, that it is actually hard to make a seamed sweater because you don't know if it's going to fit. You're kind of guessing a little bit, and you're make, hopefully making really good estimates and measuring yourself. And, um but that doing something on a bigger weight would be a good idea. And I think I will try maybe later this year to do something like that to get more practice. Because I definitely think that seam sweaters look better on people. If they fit their body, like if they fit their shoulders, they look better and they hold their shape better. I do see that. And I see that as valuable, um, as a valuable thing that I want to be able to do uh, and not be afraid of. So definitely this is a good, a challenge, a great challenge that I was ready at this time to take on. And also a big, a big, um, leap of faith that I know something about knitting that I can do something like this. So yeah, don't, this is the other thing that I did. I, at the time that I started this sweater had started going rogue gauge rogue is what I call it on sweaters where you knit a swatch, you like the material and you just adjust the pattern 
to fit your gauge. And that has worked out every single time I've done it, but I've always done it from with a top-down raglan or top-down round yoke in the round sweater. And that is a totally different thing because most of the adjustments that you can make, um, I don't think I've done it with anything with a stitch pattern either. It's always been stock and that made. Be my Tecumseh, but I don't think I changed any of the numbers for the color work. Anyway, it's caused massive amounts of time that I have have the shoulder shaping in particular. Like I don't have the same number of stitches. That's the thing. If you got a different gauge and you you're still following a size instruction, that would that might not be as bad. But I if I followed the smallest size, I cast on fewer stitches than any other size. So if I'd actually just followed the small or extra small, um, I was afraid that it would be too big. The measurements were telling me, this, the count was telling me it was going to be too big. So I cast on 12 stitches fewer than the smallest size. And so when it came to come to shaping, I had, you know, six stitches on either side of the shoulder that were, and I didn't have to bind off. And I didn't do the shoulders exactly the same because I sort of ran out of stitches after I'd done the calculations and I kind of ran out of <laughs> and so it was like I think it'll be fine I just sort of fudged it and um, I did the front better I think there's a part of me that doesn't think I did the neck shaping rows right because I also never done a sloped bind off before and never seemed something where we're done where you want to have symmetrical shaping done with bind, binding off. I don't know. Anyway, the front, the angle of the back shoulder and the angle of the front shoulders are not exactly the same. And I think I'm going to be fine because I'm just going to block everything to be. I'm going to block the, the back and the front right up towards each other as I would seam them and, and make sure that they are pinned out to be the same measurement and I'm going to see them that way hope it works out I mean I could have pulled the back out and I could pull the front yeah but it's like eh, I guess if it doesn't work when I try seaming it then I can go that route but I really yeah so that was the thing is like I went gauge rogue I caused a lot of problems for myself didn't have the experience of knitting a seamed sweater before to really know what's important What's not important? I have no idea. So, there's a lot of faith going on in this sweater. It looks good. And then, you know, when I lay the front on top of the back, they fit in together. So, that's a good sign. And then there was the sleeves. So, I've rewritten the entire sleeve. <laughs> the entire sleeve. Um, I decided to wanted the sleeves to be long sleeve. And part of the design is that um, it looks like at this point, because I haven't seen this together, that so much of the the body actually gets pulled up over the shoulder and this and the body and this and the sleeve gets seamed I kind of like right here and looking at the back panel and the front panel of this and knowing my own shoulder measurement I don't know how much that's really going to happen there's just not a lot of space maybe I should have made it bigger um for that to happen where you'd actually pull almost like a drop shoulder it's like a seamed drop shoulder it looks like and it could just be the way that it's fitting that particular model, the size they chose, her shoulder distance, a lot of patterns, in fact, no patterns, really take into account shoulder distance. And that matters for me, and it probably matters for everybody, um, because that's where the, the weight of the sweater is laying, is on structurally on your shoulders. But also, it's, the, it's wider than average for my bust size. So when you follow a bust size... Um, you are given a corresponding shoulder measurement, but you're not actually told what it is. Like, so I have broader shoulder. I'm six feet tall. I have a six foot wingspan and I may have a small circumference, chest circumference, but I don't have the same proportion of proportion of, um, I don't have small shoulders. They're not huge. I don't think anybody would notice they're proportionally nice, but I have a hard time fitting into like seams, like button up flannel work shirts. Like I'm often like not quite able to fit in them. So th I am wider than average. Um, anyway, all that to say is how do I know how long to make the sleeves? Cause I have longer monkey arms than most people. 
how do I know how long to make the sleeves if I don't know how much of the body is going to pull over on my shoulder? And I just sort of had to guess because there's no way to know because you knit the entire sleeve from the bottom up and then you put it into the sweater and then you would try it on after blocking and everything, all that stuff. You really don't know if it's going to work. <laughs> exactly. Unless you have experience, I guess, which I don't. So I wanted to make them long sleeve and I also wanted to make them long because I have long arms and in case some of them have to, some of the sleeve is actually going to have to be higher. So I am making a 20 inch sleeve for either side and I had to rewrite the, you know, I had to rewrite the, the increases and, um, the cast on number and also the shaping of the sleeve cap. And I wanted to do that all in once instead of just starting out and then going for a while and then seeing what happens, which is kind of what I did with the body. I rewrote the sleeve. It took me two hours and I haven't started yet. I rewrote it on Friday morning. <clears throat> so I'm going to start today and knit the first one. I'm going to knit them one at a time. Um, it's just more fun. I, I was really on the bandwagon of two at a time about a decade ago. I was knitting all my socks and mittens and stuff at two at a time. I'm really into that because it was so efficient and like it was really cool, like the whole magic loop or two at a time thing. It's it's I think it's an amazing thing to do, to do a double and it impresses people and stuff. But actually, I think in terms of satisfaction and feeling like I'm making progress, um, one at a time is much better. And um, I make socks one at a time. And I actually finish them eventually. Um, so that's me. Um, so I'm going to do my sleeves one at a time. And I'm wanting them maybe to be done by the end of this week. So it's Sunday and I'm hoping to have them done by the 28th. And I think I can do it. I knit so much of this body in the last week. And I have so much extra time. <laughs> on my hands with nothing happening, you know, so I think I can do it. Uh, what, have, what did I do? Um, let's see if I hit all the points I wanted to make on that. Learning disability. Yeah, I think I got all those things. Oh, I should talk about what I'm wearing. This is Ayaya. This is the um, sweater design that's going to come out next, probably beginning of May. Depends on how fast my testers are. Um, this is a, a line of shawl, asymmetrical shawl, where you start off on this side. You start off in the corner and you continue to increase. And continue to increase <laughs> oh, until you get to the 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 widest point basically I know it's hard for me to show you and then you cast off like 200 stitches at once and you get this nice long clean edge um I love the shape I love this um method of increasing too I love casting off everything at once. It's similar. People will say it's similar to find your fade in this, in the sense that you start in one corner and you bind off a bunch of stitches at once. But, um, find your fade is the type. Um, I think the original person who came up with that increasing was called, it was called mix and match that pattern. It's beautiful. Um, I don't remember her name right now, but, um, it has where you start, you start as a triangle and you, increase on either side and you have a center spine. This is not that case. This is not the case. You are actually increasing on the bias. You are increasing and de decreasing on the bias as you are actually making it bigger. So it's just a really fun shape to make. And um, wherever you want to stop, you can. You just bind off. In fact, I just taught a friend of my mom's, sweet woman, um, who has been, who has not knit a lot lately, had some yarn that she wanted to use and didn't have enough to make a sweater or something. And so I said, well, why don't you do a line of shawl? Because when you're done with, when you're let, when you don't have any yarn off, left over, you just, you just bind off, you know? Um, so you can use, it's great. It is a, a stash pressure. As long as you have enough that you can get a long enough wingspan and actually 
go around. Yeah. In fact, I just had this thought too. I have this brown yarn. You want to see this brown Madeline Tosh yarn. Back when I used to put yarn in plastic bags. This is, I think this is called Fig. And this was a colorway that I had to track down. It was already discontinued when I had seen somebody else had it. Um, I have two skeins, I think, maybe three. I pulled it out. I was doing a, I was doing an asymmetrical top down triangle, ran a basic shawl with it and I pulled it out. I just was really obsessed with it at one point and really wanted it. And I just realized that I could make a Linus with it. Um, and that would be really cool because I don't have a lot, all of it's kinked because it was mostly off and it just didn't make enough shape. I'm really, really sensitive. You may have noticed about having enough tail length to actually stay on. One of the things that people talk about shawls, they move around, they fall off of you is why people need pins is because their tails are not long enough. So one of the nice things about the Linus shawl is it makes a, a generous wingspan without as much depth. This one had more depth than I had planned to, it to have. Um, it was also a foot longer than I really needed it to be, but I wanted to have the garter and the lace rows be consistent. So you're doing four, you're doing four lace sections and four little garter interruption sections. And I wanted those all to be the exact same size. And three, that, and I did two different sizes of the shawl. The small size will have three repeats of each and the large size has four repeats. So you can do either a six foot wingspan or you can do this, this is an eight. So, um, but yeah, I mean, eight is definitely enough for me. And you can do the cute little thing where you like knot up if you want, you know, but also the cool thing about having so much wingspan is then when it's actually cold, even though you've got this lacy thing going on, you have more space, which I totally love because um, I have come to realize that while I love shawls very much and they're beautiful, but I really prefer actually scarves. You just to all get back into the scarf land here because, um, I don't know, it was maybe like the 2000s or so and everybody wore scarves like this and uh, people probably still do in the non-knitting world. But um, this is how I, I don't know, it's like a style from when I was growing up, I guess. I'm not, I'm not very old at all but um it's just sort of more me and so I want to make things that um suit what I want to wear and it it's not um yeah it fits more of my my mom made one I think it's downstairs I've worn it a lot it's that kind of like a beigey pink um, Linus and uh, it's seven feet long and it's not very deep it's like this deep so it doesn't have a lot of weight you like I want it to have a lot of wrap and I want it to stay forward but I don't want it to be so huge that it actually pulls on my neck and stuff so that's kind of like my like personal goals of having the perfect kinds of shawls and I think right now at least the perfect kind of shawl is one that's can kind of really a shawl that's shawl that's really a scarf um, and is a little bit more versatile in the way you can wear them. So that was the goal with this guy. And um, I named it Ayaya because when I was plowing out the last section of lace and I was knitting four days and just pushing myself so hard to finish it because I, I wanted to, to stick to a certain deadline, um, I was listening to Circe by Madeline Miller, which is an incredible story of that Greek goddess. Really love listening to it. Um, probably the best book I will listen to all year or read all year. I already know. So good. It's probably the best book I've read in a really long time. Um, I've been spending like six to eight hours a day listening to this book. Uh, maybe not that much. Definitely four. And uh, 
So I named it Aia, which is the island that she was um, banished to by Zeus. So it's, you know, when you name, name patterns, you have to find a name that no one's used before and that suits your pattern. And I was trying to come up with something because this is a, the rose gold pattern, rose gold colorway by uh, A Home is Fun House. It's a beautiful yarn, her non super wash yarn, which is called Dale, fingering weight. Um, it's beautiful, it's so soft. I loved using it. Um, I immediately wanted to buy more and do more shawls with it because I just loved it so much. But um, I wanted to maybe name the shawl something Rose Goldie, whatever, Rosebud. A lot of those names are taken already. So kind of had, um, I usually have a, a working name and then a, and a, and a final name. And it just made sense that when I was done knitting this, that I name it after the, the book I was reading when I was knitting it. So Aiaia is A-I-A-I-A. Just one of those words where I don't know remember what they're called, but they're same front, forward and backwards. It's kind of fun. Yeah, I'm wearing this, and I have a little push for I'm trying to get myself motivated to finish another pair of socks. Another pair I started in January. This is um, Crema from Homespun House. This is the colorway she's discontinuing. I don't know if she still has it in her shop or not. This is a I think this was Hunka. Hunka? I think it was part of it was part of the Valentine's Day sock set with another colorway that I got um, that I just decided to use for this heel. I have a lot of minis from Homespun House, so I was trying to pick get the right mini to go with these socks. Um, I finished this one officially in January, but somehow don't know how this happened exactly. A couple weird things happened. I used a yarn that was different than Homespun House. I used a, mat, a hedgehog fiber sock, which is thinner. It's a small, it's a, a smaller fingering weight, and I went down to a size zero. Usually, I, I um, knit my socks on a size one, two point two five millimeter. Um, so I went down a size because the yarn was thinner, but then I, it made a smaller heel. And so it kind of like the heel kind of like would suck off my foot as I was wearing it and it didn't stay on. And so it's kind of bummed. And that's why I didn't finish the second, really get into the second one because I was like, oh, it doesn't fit very well. So I took that heel out and I put in another Homespun House colorway, not this one, a different one, another purple. And that heel also was too small. And I don't know how, what was happening, like the right number of stitches half the stitches of the whole sock. I don't know. So I took that heel out too and I pulled, undid the sock all the way up to the heel cut um, and a little bit further. Now we're talking like I went this, I went this way up to like here. And then I decided to make it longer because I kind of thought maybe it's a little too short for me. I kind of like my socks really long. So then I knit like two inches more and then I put in the needle for the th or the heel for the third time and it worked out you know if an avant thought heel you should have the heel depth which is like this point to this point should be half should be the same depth as the instep and that other first heel, first and second heel just weren't even though they were the same number of stitches this must be my gauge gauge is a mysterious mysterious mistress <laughs> Um, and now it's fine. So I'm happy and I'm, I've got a longer sock, so I'm happy about that too. And I'm just going to finish the foot and knit the toe and then I can actually pick up the second one. Just sitting here lonely waiting for some love. Um, that will be a nice, those are for me. It'll be a nice project to finish. It's on my list. Those are the things that I have to talk about. I have just a couple things to show you. I posted about this on Instagram yesterday. This is the um, April Sock Squad yarn from a, the Farmer's Daughter Fibers. This one to me is just like such a mustardy color. It's so good. This is my favorite of the Sock Squad colors so far. 
it came on a really cloudy, like kind of depressing day yesterday. Um, so it was like this perfect little package of sunshine. You can do so much. Um, as soon as I'm done with the crema socks, I'm going to cast on possibly a pair of socks with this using my sock book. One of the patterns here. My sock book. I don't know which one. There's so many good ones. Um, a lot of them look like they would. Well, most. I don't think there's anything in here that's, that uses a, a speckly yarn. Maybe a couple. But like lightly speckled. Like a lot of these are highly textured socks that um, would look best on a solid yarn. Or they use color work or something like that. So um, it's great to get more of a solid color because I want to knit um, one of the socks from there. And then the other, the only other yarn I've gotten recently is, you know, more Brooklyn Tweed Loft in sweatshirt that my tinsel is made out of. Um, yeah, if you want to buy any Brooklyn Tweed, they're doing big sale. You can go on their Instagram and look. And they're trying to um, help local yarn stores get business and stuff. So they've offered um, what can you pay kind of discount, 10, 20, 30% off. And so um, I, my local yarn store is told, even though I don't go there very often, um, it, would, it would be, the funny thing is it would be more environmentally costly for me to drive out there than for them to mail me something so they're my local yarn store for all intents and purposes is there is a shop that's close to me in west seattle but um i have a soft spot for tolt and the kinds of yarns that they sell there i really like there are a lot of like farm to tape farm to needle yarns and um small batch stuff and brooklyn tweed and quince and co and farmer's daughter and lots of those things that i really like so they're they're my my go-to place to buy yarn from so support your local yarn store and buy more yarn oh there's a funny story with this i i didn't write this down to talk about it this is a really funny story um i bought this is what i can remember when i said at the beginning of this podcast that when i wanted to do tinsel i had some yarn already. So I either had two or three skeins at home. I can't remember. And I either purchased two or three. I, I don't remember how many of them I actually had when I started this. One. I may have had six. I think I had six. I'm not sure. But I had two different lots when I started. But I didn't remember that until a few days in last week when I realized that one of my skeins was darker and I was going to have to start alternating. And would I have lines and blah, all that stuff. Um, I ordered a skein from Tolt. As I realized that I would need another one. I almost asked them in a note. Please, if you have any yarn from this lot number from two years ago when I bought yarn from you. Please send me that. I didn't write that note because I thought that would be really demanding. Like, they're not going to have. And they did. They sent me. I can't believe it still. They sent me one. I ordered one skein. They sent me one skein with the same lot number of the of the lot I had majority of not the darker one but the this is it's this one they sent me one and the label looked a little tattered like maybe it had been sitting around a while and it was like one of the last ones or something and so isn't that amazing that I got exactly the right lot number I did have to order an additional extra skein like a day later when I realized I was gonna make the sleeves like you know 10 inches longer on each arm than I thought. And I was like, I really need another one. So then I did write a note in. It's like, yeah, I really like this lot number, but if you don't have it, then it's fine because alternating actually looks pretty good with this yarn. And there's so much texture in this pattern that um, it's actually more visible, though the lines I do have are actually more visible in night at nighttime with like lamp light than they are in sunlight and natural light. It's really interesting how the light reflects color and stuff so um but at this point there's so much going on and so much I'm taking risks on and so many things I've changed that I just have to just accept that there is going to be some some shifts of color and that's totally fine um it's just how it is so the only other interesting thing I have to say is I started reading 
last night, late last night, I picked out this book, which has been on my shelf for a while. I'm sure everyone has read it. Um, and I thought, you know, I'm finally maybe okay with a really good tearjerker because everyone talked about how like, oh, it'll make you cry and yada, yada. And so I was like, okay, I think I'm okay with that. Like my period's coming might as well just like, just go for it. And I read 135 pages in one sitting. I stopped looking at the clock. Um, I haven't been reading books. I've been listening to podcasts a lot and watching YouTube knitting videos. So I haven't been audio listening as much as I thought I would be in the last two weeks. So I haven't actually finished any books. Um, and that's just so typical me of like no reading really. And then I read like 135 pages and I stay up till three in the morning. I thought, you know, I think I should go to bed. I mean, it's hard to like feel like you should because there's nothing going on today. There's nowhere to go. There's no work to be done, but knitting. So like, why not stay up till three in the morning and read a book? But anyway, I hope that everybody is enjoying their time at home and that if you're not, that you have some good tools to help yourself get through it. And hopefully we won't be stuck at home for so much longer. I have no idea how long people say different things. Um, I hope everybody has toilet paper or they found a solution to not having toilet paper. Uh, my brother bought a bidet <laughs> and I said, told my mom she wanted to send him a bidet joke. So I said, well, well, and she looked them up, a bunch of them online. And I said, well, <laughs> she started laughing so hard that I started laughing because not that the joke was actually funny, but that she, when my mom laughs and she can't stop herself for some reason it makes me laugh really hard um so then I said well tell my tell text my brother she's gonna text my brother a joke and I was like well te keep texting them like send all of the bidet jokes to him one at a time and then apparently that was a few days ago and apparently today she said that my brother texted back and said is Vicky doing this because <laughs> this isn't really you to send joke after joke after this really seems like her and he was totally right I thought that was funny. <laughs> okay, I'm going to eat my breakfast now. That's sitting here cold. I might have to heat it up again. Finish my tea, take my immunity my vitamins, and um, no, I think I'm going to knit a sock. I really should start these sleeves. I'm kind of avoiding it now. But as soon as, it's like kind of like as soon as I start them, I'll like get obsessed. It's like a drug. You know, as soon as I take the dose of <laughs> sleeve Brooklyn Tweed, then I think I'll just not be able to look at anything else. I kind of want to finish the socks. So maybe I'll... Those people that work work on one... I had a great... Sorry, I'm rambling now. I had great advice from someone on Instagram a long time ago that said, um, literally to keep... If you're struggling with a project, that you literally keep another project, like, right next to you on the couch. Like, ready to go. Like, open and, like, waiting for you. Pick me up. And I thought that was hilarious and super smart that if you really need to switch over, that it's not just like you have to get up and go get your other project bag and pull it out and figure out where you were. Like, no, literally it's waiting for you to like drop one and pick up another because you need the relief of something easier. And that's genius. So, anyway. Okay, I'll stop. I'll say goodbye. Next time you see me, it'll hopefully be with my mom and she can tell you what she's been doing. And I can show you a couple other whips that I've decided to get for tire mix and my bag and my barley shawl, which I didn't talk about. And hopefully I am done with something next time, whether it be socks or a sweater. Bye.